Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Cinematic Excrement, and my quest to review every film that has won the Razzie for Worst Picture. And the fact that I am once again wearing this ill-fitting shirt can only mean one thing. We're doing another Star Trek movie. Today, we shall boldly go where probably hundreds of reviewers have already gone before. Star Trek V, The Final Frontier. The Star Trek film franchise has certainly had its ups and downs. I've already reviewed the first Star Trek film on this show, which is often referred to as Star Trek the motionless picture for good reason. It had its moments, but it was a slog. And somehow it was followed up by Wrath of Khan, which I would argue is not only still the best Star Trek movie to date, but one of the best sci-fi movies ever. And that story continued in The Search for Spock, which was decent, and The Voyage Home, which was awesome. So going into 1989, the franchise was riding pretty high. They had a string of three well-reviewed and financially successful films, The Next Generation was on the air, and while the show had gotten off to a rocky start, it had more or less found its footing by that point. Everything was going great. The key word there is... was. Then Star Trek V The Final Frontier came along and shat the bed. Get it? Because William Shatner directed this and co-wrote the story? It shat the bed? Shatner? Eh? Eh? You get it? Hey, where are you going? It didn't fail right away, mind you. It actually opened at number one at the box office and had the strongest opening weekend of any Star Trek film at the time. Although that was true of every Star Trek movie up until Insurrection, so I don't know if that means anything. In any case, it had a pretty sharp drop after that opening weekend and only made a little over $52 million during its theatrical run, which had to be a disappointment considering Star Trek IV made over twice that. Critical response was mostly negative. Star Trek creator Gene Rod Roddenberry wasn't a huge fan either, and even producer Harv Bennett acknowledged the film, quote, nearly killed the franchise. At the 10th Golden Raspberry Awards the following year, the film took home awards for Worst Actor and Worst Director, both for Shatner, and of course, Worst Picture. So what exactly went wrong? Well, a lot. But they did get a few things right. For one, they hired Jerry Goldsmith to score the film. This wasn't Goldsmith's first time working on Star Trek, as he also scored the first movie. And his score was one of the best things about that film, so I, for one, welcome his return. If nothing else, it was nice to hear his fanfare again. I always wondered if that confused Next Generation fans, since they used the exact same fanfare for the show. Thus, you had a movie and a TV show in the same universe, with the same music, and completely different casts. They also had a pretty good villain. The story for The Final Frontier was based on an idea Shatner came up with before he officially got the job as director. He had become fascinated with televangelists, whom he found repulsive, and wrote a Star Trek story with a villain based on those slimy bastards. Enter Cybok, played by Lawrence Luckinbill, a renegade Vulcan who went against his people and abandoned logic in favor of emotion. Originally, they wanted Sean Connery to play the part, and I think he would have been a great fit for the role. However, he was busy doing Last Crusade at the time and wasn't available. But they really lucked out with Luck and Bill. Oh, they lucked out with Luck and Bill? Eh? eh? All right, all right, I'll stop. When we first meet him, he's on a planet in the neutral zone called Nimbus 3, the planet of galactic peace. If that's the planet of peace, I would hate to see what the war planet looks like. Apparently, after the Federation-Klingon War, this planet was chosen to be co-developed by the Federation, the Klingons, and the Romulans as a symbol of peace between their cultures. In truth, the planet is a shithole and has been all but forgotten. There's a metaphor in there somewhere. Cybok is traveling around this desolate planet, amassing an army of followers and using the Vulcan mind meld to brainwash, uh, I mean, help people confront the pain of their past and thus break free from it. Yes, that is what he is doing and there is nothing shady about it, no sir. But seriously, Luck and Bill is awesome in this movie. He has a very commanding screen presence and he plays the part of this faith healer quite well. They couldn't have asked for a better villain. They also couldn't have asked for a better script. And I don't mean to say the script was perfect. I mean, they literally could not ask for a better script. 
You see, around the time The Final Frontier was in pre-production, the Writers Guild went on strike, and everything basically ground to a halt. By the time the strike was resolved, Paramount felt too much time had passed since the voyage home, and if they waited too long, the film franchise would lose whatever momentum it had left. So they rushed production to get The Final Frontier out as soon as possible. If memory serves, something similar happened with Paramount and Transformers Revenge of the Fallen. Will these people never learn? Oh, right, because if you make enough money, you don't have to learn. Why bother to change for the better when you can just fail upward? Anyway, once Cybok amasses an army of followers with really weird teeth, he takes them to the only settlement on Nimbus 3, Paradise City. No, I'm not gonna sing it. Which is apparently home to the three ambassadors who watch over this shithole. Federation representative St. John Talbot, played by David Warner, Klingon General Cord, played by Charles Cooper, and Romulan Caitlin Dar, played by Cynthia Gow. And yes, she's totally a Romulan. She has pointy ears underneath there somewhere. Really. Trust me. Apparently the budgetary woes for this movie were so severe that they couldn't afford a third pair of prosthetic ears. Good grief. Now, there's a lot the movie could have done with these three characters, but sadly, they chose to do the bare minimum. They're basically here to play Exposition Fairy. Well, the Terran and the Romulan provide exposition, the Klingon just gets drunk. And conveniently for him, and to show how this planet has been all but abandoned, the Ambassador's office is located in the back room of a bar, which features a dancing cat lady with three tits. Three tits, that's awesome. I have so many questions. More so about the Klingon than the Cat Lady, if you can believe it. As I have said before, I'm not exactly a Trekkie. I'm more of a casual fan, and I certainly do not consider myself to be a Star Trek expert. But it's my understanding that the Klingons are a proud warrior race. So how did they find the one guy on Kronos who's a fat, worthless drunk? <laughs> Well, once Cybok shows up, he and his followers take the city with relative ease, but not before a distress signal is sent. Cybok, however, doesn't seem too concerned about that. We'll soon see why. But first, we go to Yosemite National Park on planet Earth. Thanks for clearing that up, movie. For a second, I thought you meant the other Yosemite National Park on Alpha freaking Centauri. And here we find Captain Kirk is climbing a mountain. Why is he climbing a mountain? Now that we have that out of the way... So the basic idea here is the Ambassadors have been kidnapped on a faraway planet and it's up to the crew of the Enterprise to rescue them. But we have to wait for goddamn ever to get to that point. First, because reasons, we have to watch Captain Kirk climb El Capitan. Get it? Because he's the captain and he's climbing El Capitan? Hey, where are you going now? That was the movie's joke, not mine. Don't choose the messenger. And then he falls because he's an uncoordinated schmuck. But fortunately, Spock is there to save him as well as this wire. Oops. What exactly was the point of this? Hell if I know. What amazes me is Shatner's original cut of The Final Frontier was a little over two hours, but Paramount insisted he trim it down to an hour and 45 minutes because that would maximize the number of times it could be shown in theaters in a given day. And he constantly argued with that poor editor who attempted to trim it down to 145 as he insisted every scene was essential. Really, Bill? Really? To be clear, I don't mean to imply Shatner was a terrible director. He may be way too far up his own ass, but his direction is actually pretty good overall. While the El Capitan bit was stupid, the scene that follows with Kirk, Spock, and McCoy around the campfire shooting the shit is actually pretty charming, especially with Spock failing to understand the meaning behind row, row, row your boat. It's actually quite amusing. In fact, most of the humor in this movie works pretty well. I know this shit like the back of my hand. <laughs> Most of it. But anyway, I do really like this scene. If any part of this movie fits the tone of the original television show, this is it. There's also a pretty powerful moment when Kirk reveals he had no fear of dying on that mountain because Spock and Bones were with him. I've always known. I'll die alone. And in fact, at the time of this recording, DeForest Kelly and Leonard Nimoy have both shuffled off this mortal coil and Shatner is still hanging around. So Kirk's statement turned out to be eerily prophetic. At least in terms of real life. In the movie universe, he did not die alone. He was with Captain Picard, of all people. Generations was a weird movie. Oh my. Hey, that's George's line. 
Well, just when you thought the adventure was about to finally get underway, it turns out the new Enterprise A that was introduced at the end of the voyage home is in shambles because it apparently had the same budget as this movie. About half the ship is out of order, including the transporters, which is an interesting detail for all the wrong reasons. We'll get to that in a minute. So naturally, this ship isn't going anywhere anytime soon, right? Well, that would be the case if Starfleet was run by professionals. Instead, it's run by the movie's producer. Really, that's Harf Bennett. He's received the distress signal from Paradise City and orders the Enterprise to rescue the ambassadors. Kirk protests because the ship currently has a skeleton crew and is basically held together with duct tape and string, and for crying out loud, they don't even have functional transporters. Sorry, did I already mention the transporters are broken? Because they are. They're totally broken. But Starfleet insists the Enterprise must handle the rescue mission because they're stupid. The Enterprise is a disaster. There must be other ships in the quadrant. You would think. I mean, it is called Star Fleet, right? Other ships, yes. But no experienced commanders. Well, then take the experienced commanders and put them on another goddamn ship! This is not difficult! This is where the plot begins to fall apart, and the Enterprise's lack of functional transporters is revealed to be horribly contrived. Because here's the thing. For reasons we'll get to later, Cybok needs a starship. He took the ambassadors at Paradise City hostage, assuming their respective governments would send help. We already know the Federation is sending the Enterprise, and a Klingon bird of prey has also received the message, but they don't care much about the rescue. They're just looking for a fight, because Klingon's gonna Klingon. Unfortunately, the movie didn't have enough of a budget for the Romulans to give a shit, so sorry, Ambassador Dar, you're on your own. But here's the problem. The Federation, the Klingons, and the Romulans all have transporter technology. Cybok knows this. So I would have to assume he's counting on one of those three governments to send a ship to Nimbus 3 without functional transporters. Because if they do have functional transporters, all they gotta do is fly into orbit, lock onto the ambassadors, assuming they can stand still long enough, beam them out and piss off, the end. Now I know transporters have limits, they generally can't go through planetary defenses, for example, but does it look like that shithole has planetary defenses? The only thing defending Nimbus 3 is indifference. Hell, this doesn't even require an experienced commander, as Admiral Producer suggested. A rookie captain could pull this off. Basically, we're in a situation where the only way the villain succeeds is if the heroes are stupid. And they are. So very, very stupid. Oh, but just wait. It gets worse. When the Enterprise arrives at Nimbus 3, Kirk takes a team to the surface in a shuttlecraft, and they steal some horses from Cybok's men by having Uhura do an erotic dance to lure them into a trap. That's right, this movie features an erotic dance from a 56-year-old woman. Apparently, someone suggested this as a joke, and the producers just went with it. And to answer your next question, yes, I totally would. While this is going on, Chekhov, acting as captain, attempts to negotiate with Cybok as a distraction. And during the negotiation, Cybok requests Chekhov and his first officer beam down. So he was actually under the assumption that the Federation would send a ship with functional transporters, and seemingly oblivious to the fact that this would ruin his plans faster than you can say Scotty 3 to beam up. So not only do we have a situation where the only reason the villain succeeds is because the heroes are dumb, in this situation, the villain is dumb, and the only reason he succeeds is because the heroes are even dumber. This movie kind of sucks. Anyway, the Enterprise crew infiltrates Paradise City, and at this point, Kirk gets into a fight with the triple-tittied cat lady. Yeah, this is actually happening. These two things I know are true. One, this is somebody's fetish, and two, William Shatner directed this. I'm not saying. I'm just saying. Long story short, the rescue mission doesn't go as planned as Cybok has brainwashed the ambassadors, and he is surprised to find Kirk is actually the captain of the Enterprise and not Chekhov. I see. Very clever, Captain. Was it? And once they bring Cybok on board, Spock has an opportunity to take him out, but he can't bring himself to do it because Cybok is. <gasps> Spock's half brother! <laughs> Oh my god. Do you realize what this means? Absolutely nothing!
Sure, it seems like Sarek fathering a child with some unnamed Vulcan princess whom he may or may not have married, it's not clear, before meeting Amanda Grayson would be a big deal. But if you remove this detail from the movie, nothing changes. It's a twist purely for the sake of it. It also pissed off Roddenberry as he hated the idea of Sarah cooking up with some other woman before Amanda, and for what it's worth, he always considered it to be apocryphal. But technically the movies are canon, so... What are you gonna do? So Cybok gets to work brainwashing the crew, except for Scotty, who, well... <sighs> yeah. And when he tries to use his powers of persuasion on Bones and Spock, we finally get a taste of the painful memories he has been conjuring. For Bones, his father's death. And for Spock, his own birth. More specifically, his father's reaction to it. So human. I'm not sure how we're able to witness this event. Cybok isn't in the flashback, so it's not coming from his memory. Are we meant to infer that Spock remembers his own birth? Because even by Star Trek standards, that's weird. And here's a fun fact for you. In the original draft of the script, Spock and Bones were initially supposed to side with Cybok, leaving Kirk in a man-versus-the-world situation. And maybe I'm reading too much into this, but boy does that sound like Shatner feeding his own ego. However, Nimoy and Kelly both objected to this as they felt the bond between these three characters was far too strong to be broken so easily. So the script was changed, and in my opinion, for the better. Star Trek is at its best when these three are able to play off each other. If it's just the Kirk show, then all we have is an egotistical overactor. No thank you. Now you might be wondering, what the hell does Cybok need the Enterprise for? Well, brace yourself, because this is where it gets weird. Er, Cybok claims he has received a message from God telling him to travel to the center of the galaxy where he will find the legendary planet Shakari, which is where all life began. The Vulcan Garden of Eden, if you will. Naturally, our heroes are incredulous. Not just because it appears Cybok has gone cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs, but because traveling to the center of the galaxy is impossible due to something called the Great Barrier. It's supposed to be completely impenetrable, and no probe that has ever been sent there has returned. But Cybok insists it can be done. After all, mankind once thought several things to be impossible that were later proven otherwise. The people of your planet once believed their world was flat. Columbus proved it was round. Wrong! For a franchise that so often tries to get as much science correct as possible, I am amazed that they would make such a colossal blunder like this. Columbus did not set sail from Spain to prove the Earth was round. We've known the Earth was round since ancient freaking Greece. The purpose of Columbus's voyage was to find a faster route to the East Indies that did not require sailing under the southern tip of Africa. And the only reason he thought such a route was feasible is because he got his math completely wrong and thought the Earth was much smaller than it actually was. And that's how he ended up in the Caribbean. And when he got there, he introduced the natives to a host of new and exciting diseases, for which they had no immunity, of course, and the ones who were not killed off by disease were forced into slavery, and he and his asshole brothers ruled over the natives, as well as the Spanish colonists of the New World, as tyrants. And really, it wasn't a new world, because there were already people living there, and basically what I'm getting at here is it's about time we stop celebrating Columbus Day. Because there is no good reason to celebrate the life of an incompetent, tyrannical, genocidal dickweed who didn't accomplish a goddamn thing in his life except discover someone else's backyard. Thanks for coming to my TED Talk. But I digress. Anyway, after all that talk about the impenetrable Great Barrier, the Enterprise just flies right through it like it ain't no thing. Well, that was pointless. And sure enough, they find a planet at the center of the galaxy. Whoa, 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 hold on a second there, Dom. Hold on. Yes, that is incorrect. There is not a planet at the center of the galaxy. There is, in fact, a supermassive black hole, or at least we're like 99% sure there is. But in 1989, when this movie was made, we didn't know that yet. So we can cut them a little slack on that one. That Columbus thing, though, just what the hell? So our heroes and Cybok fly down to the planet because Scotty still can't fix the goddamn transporters, and what do you know? They find God, or at least a being who claims to be God. 
No, it was remarkably easy, especially considering the state of the ship. And how did you breach the barrier? We just blew right through it. It's about as much of a barrier as an unlocked door. And God asked to hitch a ride on the Enterprise so he can spread his message across the galaxy. Bring it closer so that I might join with it. Ew, I do not like the way he said that. And this leads to probably the most famous line in the movie. And it's a damn good question. What does God need with a starship? And apparently God's answer is, fuck you, that's what. Of course, this is not actually God. It's some super powerful being that was imprisoned on this planet and is hoping to use the Enterprise to escape. But now that he knows the truth, Cybok ain't having it, and he sacrifices himself so our heroes can get away. Now, the way this last part of the movie plays out is much different from what Shatner originally had in mind. Once the Enterprise crew realized the being in front of them was not actually God, it would then be revealed to be Satan, and Kirk would have to save his friends from being dragged into hell with demons and the river sticks and all that. Fortunately, the producers convinced Shatner that this might be just a bit much, and it was changed so the being was an evil alien and not the actual devil. Instead, Scotty finally gets those goddamn transporters working, but only has enough power to bring them up two at a time. So we're recycling plot points from Star Trek IV, huh? Great. He beams up Bones and Spock, but remember those Klingons? Well, they got through the so-called Great Barrier just as easily as the Enterprise, and they blow the shit out of those transporters. And at this point, Kirk was supposed to be attacked by rock monsters conjured up by the alien, and they did actually film this. But while Shatner wanted as many as six rock monsters, Paramount would only provide enough money for one, and the rubber Rockman suit was incredibly stiff and looked kinda cheap, and it was supposed to breathe fire and emit smoke, but the fire didn't work and the wind blew away all the smoke. So what we were left with was something about on par with an old Godzilla movie. And they rightly scrapped it. In lieu of the Rockman, they planned some fancy special effects for the final showdown, wherein the alien would transform into some sort of shape-shifting light blob. But sadly, their previous special effects partner, Industrial Light and Magic, was busy working on The Last Crusade and Ghostbusters 2 and had no time for Star Trek. The effects house they ended up working with was not up to the task, at least not for the amount of time and money Paramount had allocated, and their light blob effects reportedly looked terrible. So what we ended up with was God shooting laser eyes at Kirk as he ran the hell away. And that's about it. So the climax for the movie was a little disappointing to say the least, but at least we didn't have Spock and McCoy getting dragged into hell by freaking Satan. It could have been worse. Ultimately, Kirk is saved by, of all people, the Klingons when General Kord takes over the Bird of Prey. Because he can do that, apparently. I'm not sure how he's able to do that. I was under the impression he had fallen out of favor with Klingon High Command. Mainly because... He's apparently fallen out of favor with the Klingon High Command. And thus being named Ambassador to Nimbus 3 was basically a punishment, a way to put him out to pasture. So how does he still have authority over... well, anyone? And the movie ends with our heroes finally getting to finish that campfire sing-along of Row, Row, Row Your Boat. Yay. And that is Star Trek V The Final Frontier. It's kind of crap, but as far as Worst Picture nominees go, it's one of the better ones. I mean, the movie does have its moments. Like I said, the banter between Kirk, Spock, and McCoy is entertaining, the humor hits more often than not, the score was excellent, and Luck and Bill's performance was top-notch. But the story is pretty lame, especially when compared to the last three movies. It feels very similar to Star Trek The Motion Picture, which is not a good thing. The motion picture took a story meant for TV and stretched it out to two hours, and it felt like it. The Final Frontier largely feels the same way. This story would better fit a one-hour TV episode, not a two-hour movie. They also made some questionable choices with the established characters, like... Yeah. They also put Scotty and Uhura in a relationship, which just felt unnecessary and would promptly be forgotten by the time Star Trek VI rolled around. The really weird thing is, even though they're dating, Scotty still calls her Uhura, which is her last name. Who the hell calls their girlfriend by their last name? That's weirder than Mike Pence calling his wife mother. As for William Shatner, I'm not entirely sure he deserved to win the Razzie for Worst Director. 
Worst actor, maybe. He never has been a great actor, though giving him a Razzie seems like taking the easy route. But I honestly thought his directing was fine, considering what he had to work with. Shatner's problem was his inability to reconcile his vision with his budget. He wanted Star Trek V to be epic in scope. And even with the second biggest budget for a Star Trek movie at the time, that just wasn't going to happen. It's a shame, because I do think there's a good movie in here somewhere. The ambition is clearly there, it just desperately needed a rewrite. And if this movie were made today, all of those budgetary woes wouldn't have been an issue. You could have done the angels and demons and rockmen and aliens and whatever the hell for a fraction of the cost using CGI instead of rubber suits. Oh, what could have been. So did this movie deserve to win Worst Picture? Well, you could certainly make a case for it. The other nominees that year consisted of Karate Kid Part 3, which was basically a second-rate version of the first Karate Kid movie, Lock Up, which was stupid, Roadhouse, which was also stupid but unintentionally hilarious at times, and Speed Zone, which had an amazing cast but a terribly unfunny script. And honestly, it's hard to say which one of those movies was the absolute worst of the year because they're all bad in their own way but I do think Star Trek V was the biggest disappointment. It was coming off a string of three very successful movies and completely screwed the pooch. So I can't blame the Golden Raspberry Foundation for picking that one. I will, however, drag them for their choices for Worst Original Song that year, which included Pet Cemetery by the Ramones, Let's Go by Cool Mo D, and the winner, Bring Your Daughter to the Slaughter by Bruce Dickinson. I will concede the Iron Maiden version of Bring Your Daughter was much better than the Bruce Dickinson solo version, but come on. These people wouldn't know good music if it jumped up a bit in the face. Anyway, Star Trek V The Final Frontier isn't terrible, but it is skippable. I'd only recommend it if you're a Star Trek completionist. Like I said, it does have its moments, and there is a good movie in here somewhere, but this ain't it. Well, that does it for the first decade of the Golden Raspberry Awards. Next time, we finally move on to the 1990s, which unfortunately means we have yet another tie. Twice in five years. I am never going to finish this godforsaken project. Well, until next time, Hollywood can live long and suck it. me